Hey and welcome! Do you want to see something special? Isn't this astonishing? Okay, how about this one? If you lived 100 years ago and decided to investigate why corn kernels can have different colors, then you could win a Nobel Prize. You see, these different colors, the colors in corn kernels on fruit fly eyes, tell a story. The story of ancient viruses which try to mess up our DNA. Beautiful, right? So, with that, my name is Ken Steinig and today we'll talk about transposons and how they can move around in our DNA. These weird different colors are explainable by transposons. Transposons were first identified by Barbara McClintock, who saw that parts of chromosomes can attach to other parts of chromosomes. So transposons can change their location in the DNA and that's why they are also often called jumping genes. This observation, the discovery of transposons, resulted in Barbara McClintock winning the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Transposons or transposable elements are DNA sequences which are found in nearly all organisms. This includes corn, flies, mice and us. But how precisely can transposons move around? Broadly speaking, we know two different types of transposons in humans, class 1 or rater transposons or class 2 or DNA transposons. These two classes can be distinguished by the way through which they jump around in the genome. Class 1 transposons change their location in two stages. Once they become activated, rater transposons can convert their genetic information into RNA. At the same time, they also produce a protein called reverse transcriptase. And this protein then converts the RNA back into DNA and helps to get it into the genome. Hmm, you might maybe remember this mechanism from an earlier video where we discussed the conversion of RNA into DNA. We are talking about the HIV video. HIV is also able to convert its RNA genome into DNA, which is then integrated into the DNA of immune cells. This is why I also like to call transposons ancient viruses. They used to be viruses, but then they became part of our DNA. Class 2 transposons are less common than class 1 transposons and they are also less able to move around in the genome. But if they do, it works like this. They produce a protein called transposase. This protein transposase directly cuts out the DNA of the transposon and integrates it somewhere else. While class 1 transposons can copy and paste their genetic information into our genome, class 2 transposons more have a cut and paste mechanism. In the aforementioned case of corn kernels, transposons jumped around in some cells. And in some cases, they inserted themselves into DNA regions which are responsible for the colors of corn kernels. And since transposons can move differently in different cells, we get very colorful corn. Okay, so that's about different transposon classes. So now I have a question for you. Can you guess how much of our DNA contains transposons? I give you three choices. A. 1% B. 12.9% or C. 50% And the answer is C. Over 50% of our genome contains transposons. And this is way more than the 1.5% of our DNA which contains genes. You might not think if transposons now already form over 50% of our DNA, why aren't they just making more and more copies, meaning that they just take over? Well, there are different answers for that, one of which is that transposons are often very old. For example, two types of class 1 transposons called L1 lines or ALU signs have been around for 150 million or 80 million years respectively. Over 100 million years, that's roughly when the last common ancestor between humans and mice lived. Since some transposons have been around for such a long period of time, they have acquired mutations. And the more mutations a transposon acquires, the more likely is the chance that it doesn't work anymore. But of course that does not apply to all transposons, otherwise this would be a very boring video. Many transposons in our DNA can still get activated and break our chromosomes. And to avoid that, our cells have developed different mechanisms in order to inactivate transposons. 
So there are several ways how our cells can do that, but we will only focus on one mechanism called DNA methylation. That's actually the first time we talk about DNA methylation on this channel. DNA methylation means that we modify the DNA in order to, for example, regulate genes. Broadly speaking, it works like this. If a cell wants to regulate a gene, it produces the proteins DNMT3A or DNMT3B. These proteins then come to the gene of interest and add methyl groups to cytosine, which is one of the four bases of DNA. So this is one of the mechanisms for which genes can be regulated. However, cells also use that mechanism in order to inactivate transposons. So cells add more and more methyl groups to transposons in order to shut them down. Of course, no system in biology is perfect and also the repression of transposons can fail. So what happens then? Well, a lot of awful things can happen actually. If a transposon becomes activated and moves inside a gene, it can destroy the gene. And this is especially detrimental if you think about tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes are a group of genes which keep the cell in check so it doesn't become a cancer cell. And of course, if tumor suppressor genes are destroyed by transposons, then the formation of cancer is accelerated. Indeed, many different types of cancer have been associated with the activation of transposons. This includes lung, colon, eye or ovarian cancer. In 2016, a study has presented a case where a retrotransposon has inserted itself into the gene RB1. RB1 is a tumor suppressor gene and its disruption is associated with an aggressive form of eye cancer called retinoblastoma. In the aforementioned study, it has been shown that transposon destroyed this gene in the patient and his father, but not to his brother or his grandparents. So if you're interested in how cancer can evolve, we have covered it in this video here. Other diseases can be also caused by transposons. In 1988, it was found that transposons moved into the same gene in two unrelated patients. So how did these two patients end up in the hospital in the first place? Well, they both suffered from hemophilia type A. Hemophilia type A is a genetic disorder where people experience increased bleeding. And of course, in these reported cases, transposons inserted themselves into genes which are involved in blood clotting. Since this gene has been destroyed, blood clotting did not work properly anymore, leading to the clinical manifestation of hemophilia type A. Transposons also cause trouble on larger scales. In Japan, there's a widely known genetic disorder with an easy name. It's called Fukuyama congenital muscular dystrophy. This disease primarily affects the brain or eyes and leads to an overall dramatic reduction in muscle strength. Fukuyama congenital muscular dystrophy is caused by mutations in a gene called Fukutin. As you can imagine, Fukutin is involved in the intactness of muscle cells. In this disease, it is frequently found that transposons mess with the activity of this gene. Okay, so transposons can be very harmful to us. That's one side of the story. However, without transposons, we would not exist. Transposons have really benefited us in many different ways, especially when we think about evolution. Each time a new transposon inserts itself into our DNA, we get additional genetic information which we can use. It's real, real estate. By getting more genetic information, we can make more and more complicated structures leading to new species. Between humans and chimpanzees alone, transposons are responsible for over half of all changes in DNA. And transposons really did help our ancestors. To give you an example, transposons have been very important to make placentas. You see, the placenta is a very complex organ which allows an exchange of nutrients and gases between an unborn child and its mother. In order to make a placenta, we need proteins called syncytins. And syncytins are made by genes which originally have been transposons. So without these insertions of transposons, we would not exist today. Dogs would not exist, cows would not exist, and also cats. But it's not only development, even in adult human beings we find traces of transposons which are very important. For example, it is hypothesized that transposons have been very important for making the immune system. B cells are the part of the immune system which make antibodies. 
As we all know, antibodies help us to recognize and to fight off different viruses or bacteria. But what you might not know is that B cells need to shuffle around the genome and insert different parts and excise other parts in order to make antibodies. And of course, some components which are involved in these mechanisms have been made by transposons. So, I hope that you have seen that transposons can be our worst nightmare and also a blessing. If you share these feelings with me, then feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you're new here and hit the bell button in order to stay informed about the latest discoveries in life sciences. And with that, I'll see ya.